Hello, everyone, and welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is John Darcy. I'm the Managing Director of SALT, which is a global thought leadership forum and networking platform at the intersection of finance, technology, and public policy. SALT Talks are a digital interview series that we started in 2020 with leading investors, creators, and thinkers. And our goal on these SALT Talks, the same as our goal at our SALT conferences, which we're uh, proud to say resume in September of 2021. And actually this morning, uh, Mayor Bill de Blasio just said that they're fully reopening New York City on July 1st. So we're full systems go for SALT New York in September. But our goal at those conferences and our goal here on these SALT Talks is to provide a window into the mind of subject matter experts, as well as provide a platform for what we think are big ideas that are shaping the future. And we're very excited today to welcome Warren Fisher to SALT Talks. Warren started his career at Goldman Sachs Asset Management after graduate, uh, graduating with a Bachelor of Science degree in accounting from Lehigh University in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. While on GSAM's growth equity team, Warren was, was responsible for both the financial sector as well as service companies in the technology industry, hence how he's found his way to the intersection of finance and technology today. Uh, in addition to his analyst duties, Warren was a portfolio manager on several of the portfolios. Uh, over his 19 years at GSAM, Warren was a co-portfolio manager for the Goldman Sachs Growth Opportunities Fund, which was a mid-cap fund, the Goldman Sachs uh, Capital Growth Fund, which was a large cap fund, as well as the Goldman Sachs Flexible Cap Growth, which obviously was an all-cap uh, portfolio. He then joined Fortress Investments in 2013, a firm that we're very familiar with here at SkyBridge, uh, to help build Logan Circle uh, First Equity Franchise. Uh, Warren co-managed three large cap growth portfolios as well as one mid cap portfolio. And in 2015, Warren created uh, Manol Capital to ex uh, exclusively focus on the fintech industry, which is going to be the focus of our conversation here today. Now, hosting today's talk, making his debut here on Salt Talks is Jason Zenz, who's a partner uh, at Skybridge Capital, which is a global alternative investment firm. And Jason also heads up our fintech investing initiatives at Skybridge. So looking forward to a fascinating conversation uh, today between Warren and Jason regarding fintech. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jason for the interview. Thanks, John. And uh, thank you, Warren, for joining. It, uh, my first day back in the office, actually. So I'm not Anthony, uh, who usually hosts these talks, but I am in his office right now. Uh, and, and thanks, Warren, for, uh, for joining us. So why don't we dive in? Um, I'll just start with a, a quick intro. Um, obviously, at Skybridge, we're, we're very bullish on the fintech space. We've been very active on the private side this year with names like Chime and, and Klarna and others. Uh, and it's really based on a view that financial services has been ripe for disruption for some time now. And while innovation has been going on uh, over the last number of years, it was really the pandemic, in our view, that was a catalyst to accelerate uh, a lot of this disruption. Uh, UBS came out with a report recently very bullish on fintech long term, uh, looking at some of the, the secular growth drivers uh, going forward over the next decade. You have none other than, than Jamie Dimon at JP Morgan, uh, who in his shareholder letter um, really endorsed or at least embraced fintech. Um, all recent developments, but Warren, our, our guest here today, you've obviously been a fintech investor for quite a while now, uh, both on the public markets and private markets side. So why don't we just start with your general view on fintech uh, and maybe touch on whether that has evolved pre and post pandemic. Sure. Thanks for uh, having me today. Looking forward to our, our discussion. Um, maybe the, the best place to start is, is how we define fintech. And for us, it's anything utilizing technology to improve a, an established process or procedure. And that can mean various things to various people. Um, obviously, you guys uh, have a, a background on the blockchain and the digital currency side. Um, you could have digital banks, alternative finance plays, uh, reg tech, insure tech, um, robo advisors, financial advisors, the exchanges. Um, but for us, the quintessential fintech business is the, the payment space. Um, we love the predictability, the sustainability, the recurring revenue um, business models that these companies have. And uh, you know, that for us is, is the uh, quintessential fintech business. Terrific. And, and before we dive into to payments and, and some specific names in general, um, can you touch on a few of the other verticals, just round out the fintech ecosystem for us? 
Yeah. So uh, last week or a couple of weeks ago, we we had a big news in fintech land with um, the with Coinbase going public. Um, certain people may not consider that to be fintech. Uh, we have invested in the derivative exchange space for a number of years, and that covers the names like CME or ICE. Um, who owns the New York Stock Exchange. It could be NASDAQ or CBOE who does options. Um, and for us, you know, a name like Coinbase is no different than a derivative exchange. They're the intersection, the marrying of buyers and sellers of assets. And uh, Coinbase, um, which right now just does, what, four or five dozen different digital currencies, um, but it also does storage and custodial work. Um, it's just a really interesting company. It's just fascinating for me to kind of see the market cap of it of a, a name like Coinbase uh, coming up, coming the market, doing a direct listing, not an IPO, and having a market cap in the sixty to seventy billion dollar range. And to kind of put that into perspective, that's bigger than CME and I. CME's been around for over a hundred years, and uh, I certainly, while has a, a twenty year history. Um, certainly can go back over 150 years with its ownership of the New York Stock Exchange. So a lot of change, a lot of uh, new names coming into the space. Um, it just kind of reminds me that, you know, most people think of fintech as being um, a revolution. Uh, you mentioned earlier, you know, Jamie Dimon uh, doing a shot across the bow to his own employees saying that we need to be aware of fintech and technology and embrace that change and not look to do uh, kind of put our head in the sand. You know, I like to think of fintech as much more of an evolution, not a revolution. You know, I've been covering the payment space for over 25 years. And, you know, to me, it's fascinating to see it's not a, a speedboat. It's not terribly nimble. It's more like an aircraft carrier. Um, you know, we still have mag stripes on the back of our plastic credit and debit cards, and, and they were invented in 1966. Um, the U.S. got uh, EMV technology, that chip in your debit and credit card in October of 2015, but that technology was in the mid-90s in Europe. So, you know, things happen in payment land, um, I like to say slowly and steadily evolving. And, you know, for me, as, as we look at the space, the biggest market share donor is cash. And, and that might be an a area that we talk about today, just the steady market share donor for all of these digital payments and fintech names is the use of cash. Absolutely. The, the, the death of cash, is, as you call it, we, we will touch on in, uh, in a few moments. But I just want to pick up on, on one concept uh, you, you, just, uh, you just described, which is really um, the Coinbase versus the incumbents like CME and others but you can apply that to really any fintech vertical. Depending on the day, PayPal might be bigger than Bank of America. Square might be bigger than Goldman Sachs. So can you touch on a little bit the next five or 10 years, fintech generally relative to the incumbents? Sure. So I think the best place to start is it's maybe the financial sector. If you look at um, the S&P as a whole, uh, the financial sector is roughly the third largest segment in the market if you look at the 11 gig sectors of the S&P. And 80%, roughly 75 to 80% of the financial space is comprised of banks and insurance companies. And one of the areas that we do not invest in, we have no exposure to any banks or insurance companies, is we're really just chickens. We're, um, we're at, you know, we're, we stay away from banks and essentially digital banks, nouveau banks, alternative finance companies, because I don't want to take balance sheet risk. I don't want to own a company that has opaque, uh, an opaque balance sheet that's taking credit sensitive, um, interest rate sensitive bets. Um, I like predictable, sustainable recurring revenue. We like to make money per transaction in a way, revenue per swipe. And it goes to, you know, we have certain characteristics that we look for in companies, whether it's market leadership, a durable competitive advantage, what Warren Buffett likes to call a moat around the franchise, um, just those high barriers to entry. And when it comes to a bank, um, there really are no moats around that franchise. The commodity is the U.S. dollar. They're borrowing it from, from their DDA accounts, their checking and savings accounts, and they're lending it out. 
And that for us is not an ideal business. Um, we want to have companies that have um, secular growth, not cyclical growth. And so we stay away from that alternative finance part of the, of the fintech space. We just think that um, banks are ripe for, um, for having their, their business really stolen over the next five to 10 to 15 years. Well, we, we certainly agree with you there. It'll, it'll be interesting to see uh, which banks are able to innovate and navigate this. Certainly hard to bet against a Jamie Dimon and JP Morgan. Yeah, I mean, you look at, at JPM and they have a fortress balance sheet. Um, but our issue with it is, is that balance sheet transparent? Is it sustainable? Um, can you model in free cash flow? And when it comes to financials, we saw this with the, with the financial crisis. The most important thing is our management teams rationally allocating capital and with financials, with banks, with insurance companies. Unfortunately, you don't find out who's swimming naked until the tide rolls out to use a, another Warren Buffett quote. Absolutely. So we're, we'll touch on a few hot fintech companies uh, during the salt talk. And I want to start with Plaid. Um, we're extremely bullish on the company, really think it represents the fintech ecosystem more broadly, they obviously just uh, raised their Series D funding uh, led by Altimeter and Silver Lake and Ribbit Capital. Um, so blue chip uh, cap table, big jump in, in valuation. Uh, the company is currently valued at 13.4 billion. Um, give us a sense of, of your view on the company, how you got involved uh, and, and what your view is on Plaid. Sure. So um, the Manole FinTech Fund is our, our uh, hedge fund. And one of the nice things about our hedge fund is we can do both public and private. We marry those two areas of FinTech. And the vast majority of our positions are, are public. Um, and that gives us the ability to have uh, a good amount of liquidity and transparency for our limited partners. But we can, like you said, own a handful of, of private FinTech companies. And we came across Plaid back in 2018. Um, we made our investment um, in December of 2018. And if you recall, the S&P in the fourth quarter of 2018 was down significantly. I want to say about 13 14%. In December of that year, the S&P was down over 9%. And we made an investment in Plaid. And they had just done a uh, series round valuing it at a little bit over $2 billion. We actually got a discount to that. So we were pleased with that. And uh, we owned it for uh, 13 months. And then January of last year, we were reading our Wall Street Journal like you and uh, opened up and saw that there was a transaction where Visa was acquiring Plaid for $5.3 billion. So obviously a positive for us. Um, we envisioned, like most deals, that that would be a, a six to nine month kind of closing and Visa would be the new shareholder and owner of Plaid. We actually wrote a note on Plaid before we purchased it. And I don't know how many people read it. It might have just been my mom and dad were, were the only two people that read it. But we called Plaid the, uh, the sexy plumber. And it's not a, a flashy business. It's not one that builds a, a great brand name like you have with Visa and MasterCard that signify trust in 200 uh, countries around the world. Um, Plaid is very much on the back end of, of most transactions, similar to a lot of our payment processors um, who authorize, clear, and settle a transaction, names like, like a global payments or first data or an FIS or a Fiserv. Um, these are names that don't have great brand names. And we never really envisioned Plaid having a, a great brand name. What they do is they're connecting um, hundreds of financial apps, fintech apps, um, to the funding source. So if you're opening up a Coinbase account um, and you want to fund it, um, we just did this recently and we saw when we when we connected our our Coinbase account to our Bank of America account, that transaction was done by plan. Um, if you open up a Robinhood account and millions of Gen Z and millennials opened up Robinhood accounts over the last 12 to 18 months, when you fund that brokerage account, from your bank account, Plaid is acting as a connection to that bank, that funding source, that validation. 
And um, over the course of last year, um, initially the UK came out and um, wanted to analyze Visa's acquisition of Plaid. Um, they, at the end of the summer, approved that transaction. But then in November of last year, the U.S. Department of Justice came out and said, and, you know, said, time out, hold on, let's, uh, let's take a look at um, this visa's acquisition of Plaid. And they sued to block the transaction. Uh, initially, Visa came out and said, well, we've got a lot of high priced attorneys and lawyers on staff. We're going to go ahead and, and go to court. Um, and then in January of this year, they decided, you know what, let's just go ahead and terminate the acquisition of, of Plaid and um, we'll use it. Well, we signed a long term contract to use Plaid services. And, you know, for us, we were kind of at a, at a question mark here. We don't see a lot of deals get broken up. Um, we actually own Visa in in our portfolio so here we had one of our companies acquiring another one of our companies and uh, it's interesting the reason and the rationale that the doj gave for for breaking up the visa transaction was visa has a huge market share in the debit space over over 70 percent and one of the visa executives you guys should google it or anyone watching should google it if you just do visa plaid sketch iceberg sketch. You'll see that there was a, a doodle, a sketch, if you will, that a visa executive did. And the DOJ used that sketch as their ammunition for shooting down this transaction. And in it above the iceberg, you see bank connections and uh, account validation. And then below the iceberg, you start seeing items like credit decisioning. Um, you see uh, marketing and advertising, you see financial management and identity matching and fraud detection. And that is really what the DOJ got worried about, that if Visa owned, you know, Plaid, and it also dominates debit, that this could be uh, another monopoly. And so they they kind of walked away, Visa walked away in January of this year. You talked about the valuation of it, um, actually more than doubling, almost tripling from what Visa was going to pay for it. I look at it and say Visa put the good housekeeping seal of approval on Plaid. It dominates this space of uh, bank connecting and validation and the movement of, of funds. And, uh, you know, we still own it. We envision either a SPAC. It might be too big for a SPAC. But we envision the company maybe having an IPO later on this year or into next year and it being the latest fintech company to kind of come to the markets. Great. So I want to I want to zero in on the, the DOJ complaint, because to your point, it, it is fascinating. And the the iceberg or the volcano picture is uh, sort of becoming yeah. maybe system. it was a volcano. Yeah, <laughs> at least in, in nerdy fintech circles. But the, the DOJ complaint um, to us is almost an investment memo for Plaid, right? And and one of the the, the key quotes that, that I love from one of the Visa executives is that they view Plaid as an existential threat to their debit business, which as you mentioned, they they more or less have a monopoly on with, with 70% market share. Um, and so now that the, uh, the Visa deal and, and the acquisition has fallen apart and, and Plaid is moving ahead on its own, uh, obviously, a very different environment for Plaid, right? That acquisition was pre-COVID. We're now in a, a different uh, world. Um, where do you see Plaid uh, going forward? And, and what do you think the potential is over the coming years? Well, I think um, if you look at the kind of that sketch and the below uh, the waterline, uh, if you will, um, I think it has a lot to do with fraud detection um, and identity you know, confirming identities. Um, we're not really envisioning it going into the advertising and marketing space, but just the ability to move money from point A to point B. Um, we talk a lot about Visa and their capabilities. You know, Visa does 150 million transactions a day. It could do 1,700 transactions a second. And um, their capacity, their spare capacity is 40 SF. They can do 65,000 transactions a second. Um, PayPal during the holiday season did over 1,000 transactions a second. And so it really is the, the, the middle of 
moving money from point A to point B, from point B to point C. And um, to me, it goes to our definition of fintech. Is, is Visa or PayPal because they move money? Is it a financial company? Um, is it a tech company because of the capacity that they have and the, the millions of transactions that they do a day? I don't really care. Um, for me, it's not a matter of um, are they financials? Are they tech companies? Is, is Plaid a, a financial because all of their customers are banks? Um, and brokers, once again, it doesn't matter to us. We're looking for those companies that can generate predictable, sustainable, recurring revenue. And we think the future for Plaid is, is really bright. It's going to have um, a business model that's transaction-based, that's very scalable, that's going to generate very high operating margins. Um, and it, it should generate um, excellent growth for the next three to five years and beyond. Well, we, we certainly agree. We think the, the flip side to not having a, a sexy consumer facing business is obviously a much lower cost structure, much higher margins. To your point, Plaid does have a recurring revenue model. Uh, and we think, again, the, the DOJ really laid out the potential and the disruptive nature of Plaid, really just to hammer home the point, Visa is this $500 billion company doing $25 billion in annual revenue. Um, Plaid's ability to disrupt this monopoly on money movement in the United States, uh, we think, is 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 very exciting and, and has the potential to be uh, to be massive. So um, let's uh, let's transition into um, a concept that you you mentioned earlier, uh, and you have a, a presentation on this: the death of cash. Um, and I think you had some pretty interesting statistics. Uh, really, just about the rapid decline of cash in the last decade certainly has accelerated as a result of the pandemic. A lot of it is generational or demographic with, with millennials and Gen Z. Um, but I think you estimate that about 30%, only 30% of transactions in the US today involve cash. Uh, in Sweden, that number is 6%, and they have a goal to be entirely cashless by 20, uh, 2023. And that sort of be consumer behavior uh, has massive implications um, for various verticals, certainly payments uh, and others. Um, but I want to focus for a second on Sweden um, and touch on another company, uh, Klarna, which is a, a Swedish company, uh, the global leader in the buy now, pay later space, also raised money uh, recently at a $31 billion valuation, making it the largest European fintech company uh, on the private side. Um, so touch a little bit on on this buy now, pay later vertical, which is sort of inside of payments or an adjacent to it. Um, give us your view on the space and, and Klarna in particular. Sure. Um, so a lot in there on, on cash, maybe. Um, we always like to say, you know, you know, the expression cash is king. For us, it's free cash flow is king. Um, I joke around saying the death of cash, but cash is still 75 to 80 percent of global purchase transactions. And um Countries that are very institutional and sophisticated, like Germany and and uh, Japan. Japan is still eighty two percent cash based um, in terms of purchases. Uh, Germany's eighty four percent. So on the flip side of those two countries is Sweden, as you mentioned, which has that goal of of going cashless. But um, there is a slow and steady decline. We talked a, a moment ago about that. Um, decline of cash usage, but it's it's going to take years. Cash will always be a part of the payment chain. If you look in the US, about a third of transactions are still done in cash. But if you look at the $10 transaction size and $10 and less, it's still 55% of those transactions are done in cash. And so that will continue to move down, um, whether it's the one New York program in the subway system that the MTA is coming out with to allow contactless and mobile-based payments, the ability to use your phone at the turnstile to go into the subway, the train, or the bus. Um, Clipper um, is in San Francisco for ferries and, and trams in San Fran. That just got announced last week of all things. Um, but here in Florida, where I am, the highways uh, no longer had people taking cash at, on the highway. It went um, entirely digital and automated. 
um, back in 2011. So the transportation space is really an interesting area for where we're seeing cash being removed from our society. But um, on the flip side of that, within payment land, buy now, pay later is, is really fascinating. It's taken us a while to get comfortable with it because in our mind, um, we tend to look at more uh, digitally native products, whether it's you know the payment networks of Visa, MasterCard, or PayPal, the payment gateways like an Adyen, a Stripe, um, a Braintree out of PayPal, or, or the payment processors, or even the merchant acquirers. Um, it's taken us a while to get comfortable with buy now, pay later, because it really is just an installment loan. If we go into a Home Depot and buy a $100 uh, drill, um, the ability to make four $25 payments over the next four weeks, um, that's an installment loan. But uh, it's we've come up around to this concept, and there's three companies that really dominate this space, maybe soon to be four. Um, you have a firm that went public in January, uh, did very well on its IPO. You have Afterpay out of Australia, and you have, as you mentioned, the third, the largest of the three, um, being Klarna out of Sweden. And what they're doing is they're essentially offering um, consumers, Gen Zs and millennials, the ability to make transactions at the point of sale and do that equal for equal installment loans. Um, and for that, they're charging merchants upwards of five or six or even seven percent to do that. Now, you have to compare that to a hundred dollar transaction in the U.S., a hundred dollar credit card transaction will generate about two to two and a quarter, maybe on an online transaction, two and a half percent in fees. So a hundred dollar transaction generates fees of two dollars and fifty cents um, in terms of a cost for the merchant. In a buy now, pay later environment, that merchant on a hundred dollar transaction might pay five dollars or six dollars to enable that Gen Z uh, consumer to transact that hundred dollar transaction at, at Home Depot. So um, there are significant costs when it comes to buy now, pay later, but merchants are are excited to offer it to their consumers, and it's just another way for consumers to transact. They can use cash. They can use their debit card. They can use a credit card. They can use buy now, pay later. Um, and so we really are, are seeing a transformation with online or at the physical point of sale for brick and mortar retailers, um, how the consumer wants to transact and merchants want to enable their consumers to transact any way that they want. And, and to your point, it, it, it does seem that despite the higher costs, it's obviously growing rapidly with merchants seeing the benefits of uh, acquiring or attracting um, these newer, younger shoppers um, who really view buy now, pay later and, and the companies that you mentioned as really an alternative to traditional credit um, and the credit cards, which, as you know, younger generations are, are increasingly uh, avoiding uh, having having credit cards in, in your wallet. Um, you, you mentioned or alluded to the, the differences in consumer behaviors across countries and regions on the one hand, you've got a country like Japan. On the other hand, you have a country like Sweden. The U.S. is probably somewhere in the middle, maybe closer to the Sweden side. Um, but buy yeah. now, pay later in the U.S. is is relatively new. I think uh, penetration for buy now, pay later as a percentage of, of total e-commerce is around 2% or a little bit less, but growing rapidly um, to the tune of 200% or, or even 300% for a company like Klarna. Um, do you think this is a fad or do you think this is part of a longer term um, trend that will continue to develop uh, as the younger generations continue to participate in the consumer economy? Yeah, going back to maybe what I said earlier, for us, it's much more of an evolution than a revolution. Now, the, the growth rates that names like Affirm and Afterpay and Klarna are generating are eye-popping, but they are coming off a very small base. Um, we, we needed to embrace and understand millennials and Gen Zs and how they are transacting. We do a, um, a survey of uh, several hundred um, Gen Z uh, consumers, and we, we ask questions on four key financial services areas. We do um, digital currencies, Bitcoin. We do brokerage, 
banking, and uh, we do payments. And one of the takeaways from our survey work is that Gen Z is in love with buy now, pay later. It comes a little bit down to almost the U.S. mindset. of They don't think of, in that example I used earlier, that $100 drill at Home Depot. They're not thinking of it as a $100 transaction. They're viewing it as four equal $25 transactions over the next four weeks. And so, um, you know, some people buy a car or lease a car or, you know, acquire a car and they're not looking at the cost of the vehicle. They're looking at what are my monthly costs? Um, Some people buy a house and say with interest rates at this amount, um, what are my monthly costs going to be? And so buy now, pay later really is an environment where for us, we get worried that these companies are giving out credit. Um, and not doing the analysis, the credit decisioning on those consumers well enough. And so that goes to the opaque balance sheets that some of them might have. But there definitely is a ton of growth there. It's part of, of, you know, a lot of Gen Z and millennials grew up seeing their parents uh, deal with the financial crisis. And a part of that problem was their parents may be getting in trouble with credit cards. Um, That's why we're seeing a resurgence on debit. Debit usage is a way to maintain and control your spending. Um, buy now, pay later is, is essentially just uh, an extension off of debit. And it's kind of weaving in. It's maybe at middle ground between debit and credit. It's, it's really fascinating. We do think that there's going to be um, multi-year growth kind of for all three companies. One name that's getting into the space as well is PayPal. Um, They certainly have the capability to do it. And so, um, you know, we're excited for that that space. And and once again, that's a private name in Klarna that we can own inside of our our hybrid hedge fund, the Manolay FinTech Fund. Well, we we certainly agree with the the long lasting nature of of the growth story here. Um, Obviously, you know, really just getting started. You mentioned Klarna's monster, excuse me, a firm's monster IPO in January. Clarna with a, a, a big private funding round, uh, likely to be a, a public company in the near term. So we'll, we'll continue to uh, to monitor that space. Um, shift gears here in, in the, the the minutes that we we've, we've got left um, into contactless and mobile payments and, and digital wallets more broadly, which is uh, I think a space that you focus on. Um, obviously, some of the biggest fintechs out there, like a Stripe and a PayPal, Addy and you mentioned, are really enabling this shift. Um, can you just talk a little bit broadly about the future of mobile payments and tie in digital wallets there, of course? Sure. So um, I still have in, in my jeans a leather wallet and it's got, you know, a couple of different plastic debit cards. It's got, you know, Visa and MasterCard credit cards from multiple, uh, multiple banks, whether it's prepaid cards as well. And I have a, a couple of dollars in cash. Um, we envision over the next three to five to seven years being able to replace that wallet in your pocket with this, your iPhone, your mobile-based payment, it will be the way that you transact. So instead of going out with a wallet, uh, we envision going out to the store, going out to your local coffee shop, going to Starbucks or Panera or CVS or Walgreens as you do your shop and using your phone to transact. We're seeing that already with what I'm going to call that bridge, which is QR codes. they were not developed for payment. They were QR codes were developed for manufacturing and supply chain management, but the payment area has embraced QR codes and you can turn your iPhone, your Google phone, your Samsung phone, whatever phone you have into a point of sale device where you can accept payments uh, from someone else via your phone. We know the success of, of PayPal's Venmo in doing P2P transactions, simply moving money and texting money, um, you know, from me to you, if, if I were to lose a golf bet or to split lunch with you, and and that is is taking off Square and their Cash App has a as a great product as well, um, and and we really envision, you know, if you look at COVID last year, it was obviously awful. Um, global pandemics are never good, but if there was one benefit. In, in a way, it really benefited and acted as a tailwind for a lot of our payment companies. It forced the adoption of digital currencies and contactless payments. 
and um, you know forward by either a couple of years or maybe even a decade, as as some industry experts have articulated. If you go back ten years to 2010, and you looked at the U.S. Um, market in terms of retail sales, you're talking about a $6 trillion annual spend on the U.S. retail side. And 10 years ago, e-commerce was 4.5% of that total spend. And then by 2015, it continued to go up, steadily marching higher to um, 7.3%. And and last year, it got into the double digits. So we had a kind of huge wave of adoption of digital payments and e-commerce usage. Um, you know, people know that the flu can live on paper currency for 17 days. Um, the CDC came out and said last year, if you touch and handle paper currency, you should immediately wash your hands. In the U.S., a dollar bill changes uh, hands 55 times over the course of a year. And so there's a dirtiness um, to, to paper currency. And that just goes to what we talked about earlier, that that death of cash. And so we really see kind of the biggest and easiest kind of donor being cash as a tailwind for the digital payment space. And then second, we see big growth in and continued growth um, away from physical brick and mortar locations, physical retailers towards e-commerce and retailers and merchants need to have a, you know, buy online, pay in store or an omni-channel kind of presence in order to survive. And that was one of our big takeaways from last year and COVID-19 is companies need to be able to adapt. It's not just the banks and Jamie Dimon who need to adapt and embrace technology. It's your everyday restaurant needs to be able to do takeout. Um, it's your stores that need to allow their consumers to shop online and maybe even pick it up in store or have it directly shipped to them. I don't know about you guys, but I have um, a box outside of my door each and every day from Amazon Prime. And uh, all those transactions have to be done um, via a digital payment. And it just so happens that the largest payment gateway for a company like Amazon is Stripe, which we own in our fund. So, you know, we, we like the, the marriage of public and private fintech companies in our fund. And we're seeing great growth opportunities and enormous opportunities on the private side. But I would still argue that the names that many of us um, know, the Visas, the MasterCard, the PayPals, um, have wonderful growth opportunities ahead of them as well. So we're going to. We're going to bring in Bitcoin here for a moment. Anthony. All right, all right. You won't let me back I on to host with, without it. Um, but specifically as it relates to payments, I think obviously Bitcoin, at least in our view, the discussion has been settled as far as a store of value. We, we certainly believe it's, it's digital gold or, or gold 2.0. Do you think Bitcoin or more broadly blockchain um, has a space in, in, in payments uh, five, 10 years from now? So, um, you know, we like to say that any currency needs to hit on two different requirements. And you mentioned it, the store of value. And we are slowly coming around to it. Anthony and Brett have, have done a good job of beating us over the head with this. Um, and it does have, for certain institutional investors, um, a store of value digital gold. Um, I think it has a market cap, Bitcoin at least, of a trillion dollars, comparing that to um, gold being you know, 10 to $11 trillion. So there will be um, a use for it as a store of, of value. It really needs to, our issue comes down to, it needs to maintain that value, not have a ton of volatility, and uh, it can't really depreciate too quickly. And, you know, we can see Bitcoin and other digital currencies have, you know, 10 and 15% moves over last weekend alone. Um, You know, so the store value, we're on board with that. But for us, the medium of exchange part of your question doesn't really suffice. Um, Now, names like Square Cash App, like uh, PayPal, are trying to enable their digital wallet holders um, who have transacted in Bitcoin. If I bought 5000 or or $1,000 worth of Bitcoin and I want to use that to shop at CVS or Walgreens or Starbucks or Connect, whatever it might be, they're going to enable that consumer to transact. The problem with that is the IRS does not 
consider Bitcoin a currency. It considers it an asset. And because of that, you have capital gains taxes if you transact using Bitcoin. So if I walk into CVS or Walgreens and I spend $20 and I have in my digital wallet at PayPal an embedded paper gain in Bitcoin, Last year, it was up 300%. It's more than double this year. So most people have a paper gain on their Bitcoin in their wallet. At the end of the year, I have to give PayPal a 1099, a W9. And so they're going to get, um, at the end of the year, an eye-opening tax hit for that transaction. And so, you know, also, that's just on the tax front, um, we see problems with the medium of a change. You also have to look at... Um, the ability to return items. So Elon Musk um, was, made some, some fanfare for Tesla um, a month ago when they bought $1.5 billion of Bitcoin, put it on their balance sheet and said, anyone who wants to buy a Tesla um, can now do that with Bitcoin. The problem is what happens if I return my Tesla or if I buy a television at Best Buy and they're allowing me to use Bitcoin what happens when I return that item? Is the merchant acquirer and the merchant going to give return to me Bitcoin or dollars? And what happens with the volatility of Bitcoin if it has a 5 or 10 or 15% move either way from when I purchased it to when I return it? And so we see problems on the return side. And then frankly, just on speed and convenience, we talked about the ability of Visa to do 65,000 transactions a second. Um, if you look at Bitcoin and digital currencies and how many transactions they can do a second, it's seven. And so they, they're not at a level of scale, um, certainly that the payment processors currently allow me to transact. Um, and so we see some issues on the, the medium of a change. Um, you know, we're, we're there with you on the store of value. Um, the medium of exchange we're not there yet with. And, and we always go back to, you know, May 22nd, um, the anniversary of May 22nd, 2010. Uh, there was an interesting guy who used the first ever Bitcoin transaction um, was what occurred when, when Laszlo went ahead and used 10,000 Bitcoins to buy two large Papa John's pizzas. Um, and in 2010, Laszlo thought he was getting a great deal. Um, you know, those 10,000 Bitcoins now have over $500 million worth of value. So I don't care how good those, those Papa John pizzas were. That was a bad decision to use Bitcoin to transact. So, um, you know, maybe, maybe that kind of hits on some of your medium of exchange, uh, on, on the Bitcoin and digital currency side. Well, hopefully Papa John is, is still sitting on, uh, those 10,000 Bitcoins. They are not. They probably are not. W would be worth, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of yeah. dollars today. So uh, I'll end with a final question. We've discussed a couple of different payment or money networks today. Um, the big incumbent being Visa. We talked about Plaid uh, and their emergence as a, as a real-time money movement network. We just discussed Bitcoin. Uh, I agree some of the, the immediate challenges for day-to-day -day transactions, although there does some, seem to be applications for large cross-border instant transfers of money. Um, but a decade from now, what do you think money networks and payments look like um, with, with some of the, the, the ones I just mentioned, Visa, something like a Plaid, an alternative network, or a, a Bitcoin and a blockchain? Yeah, I mean, um, the people have called for the death of cash for a number of years, and in our lifetimes, cash will, will still be around. Uh, people have called for the death of the uh, remittance market, you know, the Western unions of the world, they're 170 years old. Um, and so I think uh, maybe the, the calling for the death of a MoneyGram or a Western Union probably is premature too. There will always be a need for me transacting with someone, whether it's cross-border for a remittance of even a couple hundred dollars, that transaction still might happen in cash in a decade from now. But we really think um, the big shift is going from your leather wallet to this, your iPhone, and being able to move money. Um, PayPal's Venmo really uh, dominates the, the P2P space. 
but it, it shouldn't be the only one. There should be apps, whether it's the cash app from, from, um, from Square or Venmo's uh, PayPal, but the ability for me to send money to you instantaneously through a text is to me where we're going. That's the revolution. It's going to take a little bit of time to get there. Um, that's kind of one. Um, and then two, the other really big item we see, we talked about it earlier, is is e-commerce trends. I'm not going to be surprised if e-commerce goes from the mid-teens to the high teens to low 20s percent of total uh, U.S. retail sales of that $6 trillion of, of spending. And the big three in that space are Adyen in uh, Europe, um, PayPal's Braintree, and Stripe. Uh, Stripe is, is our single largest holding. And we envision just years and years of continued growth on the e-commerce side. And, and frankly, we're earning money on every one of those transactions multiple times because I can use my Visa or my MasterCard um, account LinkedIn through Stripe um, so we can earn merchant acquiring fees, payment processing fees, payment gateway fees, um, network fees. And so we really view that as being a wonderful avenue of growth and where we're comfortable investing as opposed to the, the banking channel, which, which unfortunately still has, it's a cyclical model and it still has opaque balance sheets. Terrific. Well, we, we certainly touched on a number of different fintech themes and exciting companies out there. Uh, of course, we at Skybridge are, are very bullish on the space going forward. Uh, but Warren, thank you for for joining us and for giving us your thoughts uh, on the uh, the broader fintech space. So with that, John, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, Jason, that was a fantastic debut. I don't know if I'm going to get my job back uh, in hosting some of these salt well, talks. We look but, uh, like twins right now. So we, it entertains yeah, right. Hopefully nobody, nobody can tell the difference. But Warren, it's great to have you on. Obviously, we're very excited about the fintech space, and it's great to have an expert like you uh, on here to break down uh, everything we're seeing in the space. So thanks for joining us from beautiful Tampa, Florida. And uh, and Jason, good to see you in the office. I'll see you on Monday. We're, we're returning to office work on Monday, so excited about that. Very excited. All right. Thanks, but, uh, guys. Yep. Thanks, thanks Warren, and, and thanks, Jason, again. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in to today's SALT Talk. Uh, focused on fintech with Warren Fisher of Manole Capital. Just a reminder, if you missed any part of this talk or any of our previous SALT talks, you can access them on our website at salt.org backslash talks or on our YouTube channel, which is called Salt Tube. Uh, we're on social media. Twitter is where we're most active at SALT Conference, but we're also on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook as well. And please spread the word about these SALT talks. We love educating people, especially during the pandemic, the ability to to stream these uh, salt talks and, and educational resources into people's homes uh, you know, through digital recording. Hopefully we can see Warren sometime soon in New York, including in our salt conference in September. But uh, yeah, again, please spread the word about these salt talks. And this is John Darcy on behalf of the entire salt team and Jason here making his debut uh, on salt talks, signing off for today. We hope to see you back here again soon. <laughs>